Moses. In Joshua 24, in verses 14 and 15, Joshua said, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt, and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So choose for yourselves who you will serve. You know, if you've been in the Bible class, in the, adult, in the auditorium class, or if you're in the high school class, then you know the background of the book of Joshua pretty well that it talks about the end of the period of the wandering in the wilderness and the entire period of the invasion and conquest of the land. And the, the Israelites came in and they conquered the enemy and they took possession of the land. They had rest on every side. And Joshua in chapter 23 gives them uh, a speech where he tells them, you make sure and put away these idols if you want to keep this land and serve the Lord and He will bless you. And here in chapter 24, we have his final speech where he tells them their history of how God brought them to this point. And in his invitation, I mean, this is his offering of the invitation and really is the Lord's invitation uh, in verses 14 and 15 of Joshua chapter 24, where he is basically urging them to choose to serve the Lord, choose for themselves today who they are going to serve. And so it's a simple passage. And all I'm going to do in tonight's lesson is we're going to break down verse 15. I was going to do both verses, but it kind of got repetitive. And so we're just going to break down verse 15. I can break it down into three parts, and we're going to make some practical applications to us that I hope will be challenging to, to us and helpful. So first, Joshua talks about the wrong attitude. He says, if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord... The Hebrew word translated disagreeable or evil in, in the King James Version is the same word that's translated evil throughout the Old Testament. And th there may be other words too, I'm not sure about that. But the very first time we have the word evil in the, in the Old Testament is Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9 talking about the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the same exact Hebrew word that is used here where Joshua says if it is evil in your sight, if it seems evil in your sight, to serve the Lord. Uh, Strong's defines the word as adversity, affliction, bad, calamity, displeasure, distress. So it's kind of a, a catch-all word for anything and everything that's really bad. So what Joshua is saying is, if it seems to you like a horrible idea to accept God's will, if, if you consider serving the Lord and you think it's just too strict or it's just too much work or it's too exclusive or it's too boring or if you think it's oppressive, if you think maybe it's even destructive, then you need to make up your mind what you're going to do. You know, this is really how our society, much of our society, regards religion. Remember the song, Imagine. 1971, John Lennon. You know, we sing that song, and it's such a catchy tune. The song starts out, imagine there's no heaven. Oh, that's a wonderful song. I think we should sing that one. Later, the, a few lines later, imagine there's no hell. And a little bit later in the song, imagine there's no countries that isn't hard to do, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. And we sing this song like it's some kind of uh, anthem or something? Why would he write those lyrics to imagine that there's no religion? Well, religion is perceived by many, and it was perceived by him, John Lennon, as something that's oppressive and divisive and, and basically evil. It's, it's bad. The world would be better without religion. And I agree, the world would be better without a lot of religion. But Christianity is not is not bad, it's not, it's not evil when it's done in the way that God says to do it. So some people do view it that way. Now other people may just think Christianity just sounds dull. And for that reason, it's displeasing in, in their sight. 
I, I used to work at Cracker Barrel, you know, when Holly and I first got married, and there was this cook. Uh, there, there was this cook, this big, tall guy, not big, but he was tall, and his name was Doug, and he was always, always goofing off, and he wasn't ever serious. I tried talking to him one time about the gospel, and uh, I thought that he got serious for about five seconds when he said, you know, I, I thought about all that Christianity stuff, and it just seemed too boring. And I thought, that is so shallow. But at least he was being honest. And that's the way some people, they just look at it and they say, that's too boring for me. I mean, I want to have fun in this life and I don't want to do all that Christianity stuff. For whatever reason, to a lot of people in the world, of course, to most of the world, it is disagreeable in their sight to serve the Lord. Now, at this point, I hope that I've got you amening and agreeing, at least in your heart, that, yeah, the world, they really have the wrong attitude. Well, I hope that it's not disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord. You might say, well, uh, I'm here, aren't I? I? I mean, of course it isn't disagreeable in my sight to serve the Lord. I'm, I'm serving Him. Okay, well, maybe you are serving Him in some capacity. Maybe you are going through a lot of the right motions, but do you have the right attitude toward the serving of the Lord? Are you viewing the serving of the Lord as some kind of of a curse, as something bad, as something oppressive, as some burden you really wish that you could just get rid of. Is it really, you know, honestly disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord? You're just sort of, you know, grinning and bearing it, as, as my dad always said. If that is your attitude, then you fit into the beginning of Joshua 24 and verse 15. And so don't do that. Don't have that attitude. We should view serving the Lord not only as necessary, not only as a duty, but as a pleasure and as a delight. And it comes down to our attitude. In the 16th Psalm, in verse 11, the psalmist says to the Lord, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. We quote that verse when we want to talk about heaven. That verse is not talking about heaven, ultimately. I think, obviously, there's an application of that. But he's saying, you know, when I live this way, I have pleasures all the time. When I serve you, my whole life is filled with pleasure. It's a mentality that we need to have. So don't have the wrong attitude. As Joshua continues in Joshua 24, verse 15, he says, Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. So make a choice. Make a choice. And the choice, the choice is easy. You know, Joshua here is insinuating that the devoting of one's life to God is so reasonable and so beneficial, and the devoting of one's life to idols is so absurd and so destructive that nobody in his right mind would choose idols over God. In other words, it's a no-brainer, people. Here are your two options. It, it brings us back in our mind to what Moses said in Deuteronomy 30. In verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Okay? So here are your two options, people. There's life and there's death. Which one do you want to pick? Hmm. I, well, of course, we all know. That's an easy choice when it's put that way. I love it when our options are just laid before us real simple. Okay, it comes down to these two things. One is going to lead to absolute misery. There's, there's going to be nothing but curses if you follow this path. Your life is going to be horrible. And you're going to die hopeless and without God and with, without any of His blessings. How's that sound? No, I don't want to sign up for that. But on the other hand, there's abundance. And there's hope and there's joy and there's salvation and there's blessing. That's the life, obviously, that we should choose. And so the right choice is really a no-brainer. You know, there really are only two options in life. The Israelites could either serve the Lord or they could serve idols. 
All through the Bible, we're presented with two choices. We can either serve God or serve idols, as it were. We can either choose life or death, spiritually. We can choose to be a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness. We can choose to serve God or serve mammon. We can choose to build our house on the rock or build our house on the sand. We can choose to follow the narrow path that leads to life or the broad path that leads to destruction. You see, I could go on and on with this. Put simply, we have a choice between heaven and hell and the corresponding lifestyles that lead to either one. It all comes down to two choices. And so what do we need to do? We need to make up our mind. You know, there's tremendous power in making up your mind to do something. Uh, I asked Jonathan Aiken this, this morning permission if I could use him as an illustration. And uh, he said that was fine. J Jonathan Aiken, if you've talked to him any, any recently, uh, he's real excited to talk about the fact that he hasn't eaten food for 14 days. He's been drinking water. And he stopped eating food for 14 days to get healthier and, and cleanse his body and lose weight. And whew, I am amazed at that commitment. In fact, before he started this two-week fast, uh, we were eating lunch together at Panera Bread. And, and Jared was there. And uh, Jonathan was telling us about this fasting idea while he was eating a bag of potato chips. And I just thought, I just can't take him seriously. I mean, I, 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 I just don't really think he, he really means this. And, and then I learned that he's actually doing it. And what it comes down to is he made up his mind. He was just fed up with his health. And he just said, you know what? I'm going to lose 40 pounds. And I'm going to do it quick. And that's what he decided to do. There's a power in just making up your mind to do something and following through with it. Having the integrity with yourself to keep your word to yourself and God. I'm going to do this. It's one thing to talk about making a decision and to think about it. It's another thing to actually make the decision and follow through with it. But there's power in making up your mind. I want us to turn to Psalm 119. You can mark Joshua 24, please, but turn, if you will, to Psalm 119. And we're going to read starting in verse 105. Starts with a famous verse, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and I will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. The psalmist David here is saying, I have made up my mind. That's what I'm going to do. He continues, I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. O accept the free will, free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray from your precepts. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. You see what he's saying here? I've committed myself. I've made up my mind. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to do it no matter how, how much affliction I face in this life. I'm going to serve the Lord from this point forever. It's a commitment. That he made. One reason some people have never been baptized is because they just can't seem to make up their mind. They're actually still weighing between the two options. Serve the Lord or don't serve the Lord. Serve the Lord or serve Satan. And as obvious as the right choice is, they are still persuaded to keep serving Satan, at least for the time being, until they're finally ready to, to take the plunge. I, I, that, no pun intended on that. And, you, you know, you look at that and you say, well, that's illogical. Well, people don't think logically when it comes to sin. They don't think logically when it comes to sin. Recently, you, you've learned, uh, as it has been announced, that my cousin Trent Parrish, at the young age of 28, passed away. I wasn't real close to Trent growing up. Uh, he was quite a bit younger than me. 
But um, I knew him, you know, we, we kind of grew up in the same neighborhood and everything. It was all my relatives, that was my neighborhood. And, uh, but he grew up with cystic fibrosis. And so he was told from an early age, you're, you're not gonna live very long. And he wasn't expected to live as long as he did, actually. And uh, he was taught the truth. He, he, he grew, up, grew up being taught the truth. He knew what to do to be saved. I think he really wanted to. In fact, I talked to him one time about the gospel. Holly talked to him about, you know, serving God before. And uh, he, he wanted to, but I think that since he knew his life was so short, he just wanted to enjoy this life as much as he possibly could. And he pretty well did. He just couldn't seem to make up his mind to really commit to the Lord until right close to the very end. And as you saw, many of you saw in the email, he decided he wanted to get baptized. And he was basically under what, it's basically hospice, but it's called comfort care, where you get to do pretty much you, you, whatever you ask for, they're going to try to do that for you, make you happy and stuff like that. He said, I want to get baptized. They said, well, that, you know, that's not possible. I mean, we can bring some little water and drip it on your head. We can baptize you that. No, no, I want to get immersed. Well, he was on oxygen and uh, basically on his deathbed. Well, if you go and do that, that'll, that may really kill you just right away. No, I want to do it. And so they brought him to uh, a swimming pool at a rehab. The chlorine was so strong in there that even healthy people could hardly breathe in there. And they were fanning. I saw a video of this. They were fanning him just so he could breathe. And I later learned that he had a panic attack when he was in there, but he said, no, I'm going down. I want to get baptized. So here he's on this breathing machine, and they, he's just skinning bones, and they put him down in the water, and quickly the, the, the preacher, or whoever it was, uh, after getting his confession, he removed the mask and plunged him in the water. He was baptized. You know why? Because he made up his mind. I'm going to do this. I don't care. I don't care if it kills me. I'm going to get baptized. I wish he had made that decision earlier in life but I'm glad he made that decision. What I'm saying is I want to encourage you if you've never made that decision to make that decision or if, or if you need to be recommitted to the Lord to make that decision, to make up your mind, that's what you're going to do and nothing's going to stop you. Let that be your attitude. You might say, well, I'm not ready to make that choice yet. Well, that's a choice. By not making a choice, you've made a choice. You're deciding to continue serving Satan and to continue being lost. In Acts 24, when Paul spoke to Felix, uh, the, the Roman governor, it says, Now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. That was his choice. And as far as we know, he was never saved. He was never saved, as far as we know. You see, there is no middle ground. You're either with the Lord or you're against Him. You're either on His side or you're on the side of Satan. Jesus said, He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So make up your mind. Which side are you going to follow? Don't Quit trying to ride the fence. You can't ride the fence. You, you, you think you're riding the fence, but you're really just on the side of Satan until you give yourself to the Lord. Life is just a series of choices. Zig Ziglar, the great motivational speaker, he's dead now, but he said that he used to be overweight by choice because he never accidentally ate anything. Every bite that he ate, he chose to eat that. Now, let's make a spiritual application there. Now, we may accidentally sin from time to time, sinning out of ignorance. Even if we're trying not to sin, we may not know all of God's Word, and we sin from time to time. But my point is, if you're spiritually out of shape, or if you're spiritually weak, or if you are spiritually dead, it's because you chose to be that way. You chose that. Even if you simply chose not to be otherwise, it was your decision. We just need to be honest with ourselves of why we are in the spiritual shape we're in, it's because we chose to be in that shape. That's what it comes down to. And the choice is always ours to make. Now, that's not what Calvin taught. John Calvin taught that, you know, God decided before the world began 
what all was going to happen and all the choices were already made by him because he's sovereign and therefore you and I think we, don't, we, we have choice, but we don't really have choice. Even it, you know, the only way somebody can even want to be saved is if the Holy Spirit quickens him and now he wants to be saved. You, you don't really just want to be saved on your own. Well, that, that is not what the Bible teaches. That is complete false doctrine. And this passage in Joshua 24 and the other one in, in Deuteronomy 30 where, uh, you know, where Moses says, choose life or death directly oppose and destroy the doctrine of Calvinism. But what does that mean for us practically? Well, for one thing, you do not have to follow wickedness. Nobody is trapped. No one is so deeply entrenched in sin that they have no choice but to follow false religion or to follow no religion at all. Sometimes we tell ourselves that. You know, well, I, I just I have to follow this path. I'm kind of stuck. I'm trapped. No, you're not. Nobody is trapped. You can choose to pursue the Lord no matter what situation you're in and no matter what has ever happened to you in the past. On the judgment day, you and I will have to give an account for what we have chosen to do in this life on a daily basis. It, it comes down to small choices, really, is what it comes down to. And just as nobody can force you to serve Satan, nobody can force you to serve God. Not even God or Jesus can force you one way or the other. In uh, Matthew 23, Jesus said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Here Jesus is longing for them to come. Listen to my word. Be saved. And they were unwilling by choice. And Jehovah, He wants everybody to be saved. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, this is a volunteer army. You all came here tonight because you wanted to serve the Lord. Nobody forced you, nobody twisted your arm. You wanted to be here, and so you came. And I'm, I'm encouraged by that. You and I all have the ability to be soldiers in this army or to not be. And to fight or to not fight. And as long as you're still alive, you have that choice. You have that choice. So do what Joshua said. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Finally, Joshua ends verse 15 of Joshua 24 saying, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I'm still trying to figure out if he used proper grammar. I'm looking at that and saying, shouldn't that be like my house and I? Or, well, so me and my house. What a wonderful example Joshua set for the entire nation of Israel. What a great spiritual leader he was for his family. What Joshua was saying is, listen, I, I can't control everybody else. I can't control anybody else, but I can control what I do. And I can control what my house does. Now, of course, you can't con totally control what even those in your house do. But you have a great influence on them. Interestingly, we never read of Joshua having any children in the genealogies. No children are listed under Joshua. We don't know if he actually had children or not. Or maybe this house uh, refers to his servants. So maybe he had children that we don't, that we don't read about. But either way, he had a household. And uh, his point is, follow my example, make the same choice I'm making. He was determined to serve the Lord and to lead his family to do God's will. He wanted the entire nation of Israel to follow his lead on that. And for the most part, they did, didn't they? They did well as long as he was alive and the elders who outlived him. You see, setting the right example is the most powerful sermon that you could ever preach. As we say, actions speak louder than words, or more is caught than taught. Or as Athanasius, the Greek theologian of the 4th century said, example is not the main thing influencing others, it is the only thing. We sometimes don't realize how powerful our example is. I've said before in a sermon that the, Ital the Italian word for influence is influenza. The word influenza was introduced into English in the mid-1700s. Apparently, it came from the Italian phrase that attributed the origin of this malady to an influenza di freddo, influence of the cold. 
And so, I mean, it's, it's no accident that the word influenza and influence, that those two words are almost exactly the same. Right now, there's a terrible influence, uh, influence outbreak. There's a terrible flu outbreak. Uh, someone was telling me this morning that he really regretted that he can't go to Dallas to see his mom. She's, she's in a nursing home, and at that nursing home, they have said no visitors because there's this terrible outbreak of the flu, so he can't go and see his mother. Another person here this morning was fist bumping people. I said, are you sick? He said, no, I'm trying not to get sick. It's just, it, it's in the air. The, the flu spreads in the air. And so that, that's kind of startling. It's kind of scary, you know? It spreads very, very easily. We are by our very nature's very contagious people, spiritually. Our, examples, our example tends to spread to other people as easily as the flu spreads. Everybody exerts this influence. You may think, nobody's paying attention to me. I'm not an influence on anybody. Yes, you are. You are as influential as the flu. You are influencing everybody whose lives that you touch around you. So be an example, like Joshua was. We need to be an example of righteousness. I'm thinking of the, the lesson that uh, Brian preached this morning. And I want to tell you that I think you're doing really well. Because I know that for many of you, you are tired. And I think that you're all doing really well. I know that sometimes we do the head, head bobbing thing. We got that going on sometimes. But I think everybody's doing a really, really good job. In Titus chapter 2... Now, maybe Brian, on the other hand, he's falling asleep over there. I'm not sure about that. No, he's doing well, too. In Titus chapter 2, Paul told Titus, In all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds, with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing to say about us. What kind of example are you setting? Would your friends and co-workers know that you're a Christian if you never said anything about church and you never mentioned being a Christian, nobody ever asked you, and you, you never mentioned that at all? Just by looking at your life, would they know by the way you talk, the things you don't participate in when others are gossiping and, and they, they don't hear lying come from your lips and, and they don't see you partaking in the same activities they do when they go off drinking, you politely excuse yourself and things like that. Would they know this person is a servant of the Lord because it's different without you saying a word. What kind of spiritual leader are we to our family? Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What do your kids see around the house? Do they see you lose your temper? Do they see rudeness and selfishness? Maybe even bad language or hurtful language? Maybe if nothing else, just just plain grouchiness all the time. That's not the spirit that the Lord has given us. What do they see around the house? Because I'll tell you, your children and my children, I know this because I've experimented with it for the last 12 years of my life. They will do what you do. They may or may not do what you say. But they will do what you do. What we need to... What we need to do, parents, what we need to say is, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We need to resolve that that's what we're going to do. We are going to serve the Lord. And who is the spiritual head of the family? It's the Father. The Father is the spiritual head of the family. In Ephesians 6 and verse 4, Paul says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline of and instruction of the Lord. Notice he doesn't say mothers. He doesn't say fathers and mothers. He says, fathers, bring your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That doesn't mean that mothers are out of the picture. We could look at a ton of passages to look at mothers and their role in the home, and they wield a powerful influence, and they are to be spiritual leaders as well. But the spiritual leader is the head of the family. This goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And it's the husband. It's the father. He is the one that is to set the pace, the spiritual pace for the family. He is the one to make sure that the children are being taught the Word of God and to make sure that we are serving the Lord and to set the ultimate example for all of His family to look up to. I'm preaching to myself. The Father is the leader. Now, mothers, as I said, are also spiritual leaders. I read in one place that, that mothers spend on average 70% more time with their kids than fathers do. 
I don't know how anyone would even know that, uh, but I guess there was a poll done. But anyway, more time spent from the mothers than from the fathers. I think we can probably all attest that's pretty well generally true in the lives that we've lived. And so what that means is the mother is a huge influence. The, the father is also a huge influence. So the nucleus for the spiritual training of your children is the home. It is the home. It's not, it's not actually the church. It is the home. So take control. Take the reins and lead your family in serving the Lord like Joshua did. One day as your children grow, you're going to have far less control. Far less control. Eventually you may have no control and maybe very little influence, if any, depending on your relationship with your kids and their age and so forth. So while you still have the influence that you do, I want to encourage all of us parents as well as grandparents to lead with all the gusto we've got, to be proactive about it, to be zealous about it, to be diligent about it, as, as Moses talked about in Deuteronomy chapter 6, to teach these words diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. We need to say what Joshua said. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. One of the best examples that I can think of of a family that has done this is the Petty family. I asked Terry permission to talk about him tonight because I don't like embarrassing people. I didn't ask Veronica, though, sorry. But uh, I hope this is not too embarrassing. I know y'all were talked about this morning in a positive way, and so, but, but you have been a great asset to this congregation. And uh, I've been here not two years yet. In May, it'll be two years. And they, they've come since I've been here. So I can't remember exactly when y'all came, but I, I know that Terry decided to recommit himself to the Lord because he was drifting from the, from the Lord for years. He was away from the Lord. And so he came, and he came forward, and, and he made known his commitment. And Veronica was baptized. And then soon, all three of their kids, and they're not little kids, obviously, as we know them. We, we, we know they're, they're older. Uh, they were all baptized, one at a time. And it's because, ultimately, the spiritual leader of that family... The father said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And he wielded whatever influence he still could on his family. And God be praised that his family responded because they had the choice not to. We need to follow. We need to be that way in our families. The people respond to what Joshua says in these two verses. In verse 16, the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God is He who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and who did these great signs in our sight, and preserved us through all the way in which we went, and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. The Lord drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for He is our God. You see how they are mimicking what Joshua said. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They are saying here, we also will serve the Lord, for He is our God. Joshua said, you won't be able to, because when you're wicked, God will punish you. They said, verse 21, no, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua says, your witnesses... Of what you've just said, they said, we are witnesses. He said, put away your gods. Verse 24, the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey His voice. Joshua is now satisfied. You see, Joshua wanted to hear that. He wanted to know that these people were not just doing what they were doing because he said, this is what God says you need to do. He wanted to know that they were doing it because they took ownership and because they chose this path proactively. And ultimately, brethren, that's what we all must do. We must take ownership of our spiritual life and of our spiritual path. We don't do this because it's what our mommy and daddy do. We don't do this because it's what your girlfriend or your boyfriend does. Or because it's what your husband or your wife does or because it's what your friends do. 
You do it because it's what the Lord wants you to do. And you choose that path for yourself because one day when you stand in judgment, you're going to give an answer for what you have chosen to do, not just what your family or whoever told you you should do. Jesus, who is the ultimate fulfillment of Joshua, is asking us to make a choice, to choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. Are you going to serve the Lord? Or are you going to serve Satan? And we need to say what those Israelites said, we will serve the Lord our God and we will obey His voice. And we need to commit to worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. You might say, oh, I'm already committed to the Lord. Well, I'd like to think I'm already committed to the Lord. But no matter how committed you already are to the Lord, I want to encourage you to recommit to the Lord with more resolve maybe than you've ever done. Because the, tr the truth of the matter is, we choose every single day what our commitment is. Every day we choose either to serve the Lord or serve the world. So we need to recommit ourselves now and every day. And if you've not made the choice to commit your life to the Lord, then I want to encourage you to do what Joshua said and choose for yourselves today. The point is, you know, this is decision time. You've you got to make a decision and, and go with that. Serve the Lord while you still can make that choice. By waiting, you are making a choice to continue serving Satan. And if you die, die lost in your sins and you go to hell, it won't be because God sent you to hell. It'll be because you chose of your own free will to go to hell. And you'll have to live with that for the rest of your life. If you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you to do that. You can have salvation. You can choose salvation tonight. If you are of an accountable maturity before the Lord, I would urge you to make that choice. If you need to recommit your life to the Lord, you can do that right now sitting in your seat. But if you need our prayers, we would urge you to come to the front as we stand and sing.